How does a firm amass such big positions synthetically? And I'll give you uh, an I'll give you an extra order of tater tots if you throw in contracts for difference and or total return swaps into your answer. <laughs> well, when I was at CNBC, they taught us not to overcomplicate things on the air. So I'll just say the, the, the concept oh. here um, was that Archegos wanted to take some of these large positions, but they, I guess, I guess, because we haven't spoken to them, wanted the anonymity of a swap, like a total return swap might be one example of the uh, trade we're talking about. And effectively what would happen is the prime brokers, the banks that lent money to Archegos would go out and buy shares of the stocks that Archegos wanted to be long. So Viacom CBS, a great example. Um, if you look at the most recent 13F filings, you find that a lot of these banks seem to have amassed larger positions than whatever they had going into the quarter uh, in Viacom CBS. So you see a lot of buying activity by Nomura, by Goldman Sachs, by Morgan Stanley and others. And that was actually a tell for those that followed the stock that probably there was a big money manager or two out there that was building up a position through swaps because unlikely that those banks would buy uh, such large volume just for themselves. So for Archegos, they would get essentially, as Leslie said, the economic exposure to the stock um, through this arrangement they had made individually and bilaterally with each of these banks. Um, but they would not have to own it. And importantly, they would not have to disclose it. And if you think back to the GameStop yes. situation, the beginning of that, right, what, what got Melvin Capital into trouble, I guess, is that they had to report ownership of put options, which effectively told the market were, were uh, massively short these stocks. Normally, you would not have to report a short position with a few exceptions like in the UK. Um, and that was a similar case here. The market didn't exactly know who was doing this or why. Uh, and when the move happened, it was large and shocking. It was. And it, Leslie, listen, I, I, you know, Kate won't do it, but I will. I'm going to say something that our management won't like. So if any of our <laughs> bosses are listening, mute the volume. Um, Every quarter, we talk about these 13 Fs. We call it whale watching. We look at, you know, the big funds, SEC filings on what they hold. I'm not saying they're not worth looking at, but here's the reality of the modern Wall Street. A lot of those positions might be fake positions or dummy positions to mask trades that are exactly the opposite, i.e., you own some of the actual equity, but you are synthetically short other positions through these TRS is total return swaps, or what I mentioned earlier, contracts for differences, which are swaps, ways to bet against things synthetically. You don't own anything. You're betting on a move. You can be paid up front. By the way, those are illegal in the United States, but they're very profitable, or they used to be, in Europe and parts of Asia. But the point is, don't always believe what you see on the filing, correct, Leslie? Mm -hmm. Because there may be a different, bigger yeah. bet going the other way. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's not something that hedge funds are new to. They have had to file 13 Fs for, I think, decades at this point. Um, and so they've figured out what happens when you disclose a certain type of position, a certain size of position. People catch on to it. They see what you're doing. Mm. So they found creative ways to not have to disclose exactly how they're positioned to leave them to certain vulnerabilities, as Kate mentioned like Melvin found itself with regard to GameStop, for example. Now, I do wonder, you know, if we kind of look at the postmortem of our Caicos Capital and some of the, the potential uh, impacts from it, you know, will the SEC be looking at rules regarding uh, disclosure, transparency, things of that nature? This is a family office. It's not a hedge fund. And so yeah. their disclosure requirements are even you know, less transparent. Um, and so all of those things, I think, are important considerations as we kind of take a step back and look at what has happened over the last few days. Yeah, and, and talking to people in the street about it, Kate, I mean, uh, one thing seems to be sure, Goldman Sachs has won again. Uh, you know, G Goldman Sachs is the one that looks like they have come out of this smiling. Well, of course, as the market showed you yesterday, Nomura in Japan, Credit Suisse, they were left not only holding the bag, but probably some of the credit risk as well. But Goldman getting out in front of the gate, right? As soon as the gate opened, they were selling hard. And it reminds me of the, the movie Margin Call. You know, by 8 a.m., we got half the position. And by 11, you're out. And Goldman looks like they're a winner. Yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, I talked to a sort of veteran 
prime brokerage executive and a person who had run um, markets groups in the past yesterday. And the guy said to me, of course, he didn't want to be named with this kind of blue language, but he said, this whole situation to me is like a string of, are you effing kidding me? Like why uh, <laughs> risk management in this person and many people's view sort of absent at Nomura, what happened at Credit Suisse? Um, it does seem to your point, Brian, that Goldman and Morgan Stanley uh, handled this with uh, pretty good risk management apparatus and ended up uh, with, with immaterial losses, if any, on the Goldman side is what we know. And Morgan Stanley hasn't said anything about potential losses, but our sources tell us uh, that the expectation is they'll be minimal, if any. So yeah, I mean, the, the management or, here seems to be sound. Kate, can I, can I flip it a little bit too, just talking to people as well, and, and there are some that, that out there that believe, and we, don't, we probably will never know, Goldman Sachs may have made money here. So I reported on that yesterday. I think that's always a possibility. Um, I think they're still unwinding the trade a little bit. So it remains to be seen exactly where they end up, but it's possible. You know, Leslie, and here's the thing about Goldman Sachs and Bill Wong is that they, he got in trouble, had some SEC issues related to mm -hmm. Hong Kong listed stocks. I think that was 2012. Gosh, it's almost 10 years ago. Anyway, right. he was kind of banished by Goldman Sachs, right? They're like, well, we're not going to do business with you. At some point in the last few years, somebody let him back in, right? Some sales traders like, boss, please, he's a big money, he's safe, yep. I'm sure. They brought him back in, and, and now this. I mean, th this was sort of a round trip for Bill Wong and Goldman yeah. Sachs. Yeah, it, it just goes to show you what the prospect of significant fees can do for your reputation. Um, but no, you're right. Uh, it has been reported that, you know, he did not pass muster with Goldman Sachs's reputational committee. Uh, however, he did have agreements all over the street. We know of at least six prime brokers that he was dealing with. Uh, and you bring up kind of the, the who gets ahead here with regard to those prime brokers. Uh, the FT actually published an article overnight looking at how the, the main um, prime brokers that he was dealing with actually met last week and had a conversation about how to orderly unwind the trades and make sure that, you know, everything was was done in an orderly fashion. Um, and then, you know, certain firms yeah. broke ranks. They sold earlier. Of course, it's kind of like a prisoner's dilemma kind of situation there, um, you know, with regard to just the psychology of, of banning together as a team yeah. versus kind of going rogue for your own benefit. So, um, Really interesting behind the scenes stuff going on. You know, well, there's and, also and, a domino Kate, effect really that occurs cast... here, right? Yeah, go ahead. Well, no, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say there's a domino effect that occurs when, as Leslie noted, you know, some broke ranks. So you had kind of Thursday night to Friday morning, two key prime brokers in uh, Credit Suisse and Morgan Stanley declaring yeah. uh, Archegos in default. And that actually triggered a technical aspect of the, the prime brokerage contracts with others that allowed them to default Archegos as well. And that's when the asset seizure and the massive sales began. And, and so much of this is, is on this swap market as well, Kate, and, and uh, you know, and probably triggered just by that Viacom CBS secondary. I don't want to scare anybody, uh, Kate, and you don't have to comment on this if you don't want to. This is related to Viacom and Discovery, and no offense to them, not exactly high-powered stocks. I have said that Tesla is the most important stock in the world. And I don't say that because the stock's been on fire or I like the cars. I say that because when you look at the sort of dark underbelly of derivatives, ask any trader out there on swaps and derivative desk, so much is tied to Tesla or, or a few other big technology names. Mm. I think the bigger story here may be what's the bigger risk on bigger names and how many derivatives and swaps and synthetic positions are placed on things we have no idea about. Right, and of course the reason that uh, market participants like to use these complex products like swaps is to give them some anonymity and with that comes the nimbleness to be able to get in and out of positions without moving stocks as much as you would if your position were public. That said, it's interesting you bring up uh, Viacom CBS not being exactly a power stock. I did some reporting on that name yesterday because I wanted to understand what the fundamentals were and uh, mm -hmm. one analyst I spoke to said, you know, it's so interesting. What, uh, what we noted in the analyst community who follow these media stocks is not so much the fall of that price of that stock last week, but the rise. There were, there were no fundamentals yeah. 
to support a price that was pushing $100. Um, there was this offering in the market that you mentioned. It was, it was new equity and also some convertible bonds. Um, and the management team essentially thought, let's take advantage of this high flying price. Let's, let's raise some capital for some of our longer term plans. And that was fine to do, but it seemed that the market didn't like it. They weren't able to raise quite as much as they expected. They yeah, ended up yeah. at about 2.65 billion, not three. And somewhere in there, the stock started this precipitous fall even before the asset seizures occurred. You see the stock ticking down through the course of the week. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.